All right, you guys want to get started? Should we wait a little bit? I don't mind either way. All right. All right, Brian, are you there? Preston, are you there? Ace, are you there? Danny, are you there? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, I can cool. hear you. Good. Let's do uh, let's do Ryan first. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about phacomatoses. <clears throat> I like phacomatoses. I think they're kind of fun, but uh, they're a lot to remember. Uh, so we're going to kind of go over some teaching slides, but then we're also going to go over some ways to remember them. Uh, feel free to take them. Feel free to say it's stupid and not take them, whatever you prefer. So uh, just as background, if you see anything with uh, Vin Diesel, it's autosomal dominant. If you see a rhesus pesis, it's autosomal recessive. And if you see the gla galaxy, then it's uh, for glaucoma. Okay, uh, Ryan, what's the top picture of? Lish nodules. Very good. So uh, um, good, they're Lish nodules. They're small tan pedunculated lesions on the anterior iris. Um, Whenever you see this kind of patient, we're going to go in a format where we describe it. We do a history. We do an exam. We do testing. You tell me what it is. You tell me if they need any kind of images or labs. You tell me how to educate the patient and what your plan is. So obviously, any kind of history, you're going to ask for any kind of onset or duration of symptoms, any visual changes, any double vision. And for all these uh, you know, fake mitoses, you have to ask for any systemic or neurological issues. So that's the history. What kind of things are you looking for on exam? Neurofibromas, plexiform, uh, you know, mass on the eyelid. Very good. Glioma. Very good. Uh, what else? What else other, what kind of skin lesions can you see in neurofibroma? Besides the flesh-like lesions? Yes. Oh, besides... um, hold on. Uh, cafe au lait spot, is it? Very good. Yeah. So you have cafe au lait spots, you have neurofibromas. Uh, if you have a plexiform, if you have a plexiform lesion, what are they associated with? Like histologically or? No. If you, if some patient comes in with a plexiform neurofibroma, uh, what other exam should you do? Which is what you typically do. You know, you usually check your vision. The, the patient may have amblyopia, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you think his pressure will be high? Could be. <clears throat> Patients with plexiform neurofibroma have glaucoma. It's associated with glaucoma. Nobody really knows why, but they think it's just because of some type of structural abnormality that causes also trabecular issues. But if a patient has plexiform neurofibroma, that means that they have glaucoma on that side. Okay? So okay. you got vision. Yeah, you want to check pupils. Why do you want to check pupils for? Um, if you have like, like optic neuropathy from the Good. compressive. Absolutely. So pupils for an APD, check pressures because plexiform neurofibroma could be associated with glaucoma. You want to check for strabismus. So you want to do EOMs, you do confrontational visual fields, and then you do a slit lamp exam. On slit lamp exam, what are you looking for? Lish nodules. Very good. You're looking for lish nodules. Do you find anything else in the cornea? Oh, gosh. Um, By the way, this is really hard. I'm giving you all the buzzwords, and then I'm going to show you how you can kind of remember them all, but but this is not easy. I'm trying to give you as much factual information as possible. You could also see enlarged corneal nerves. That's just something that's seen with neurofibroma. Just a, That's just a OCAP question, enlarged corneal nerves. And then you want to look at the nerve, because what could be wrong with the nerve? I mean... As you said, glaucoma is um, or atrophy. Or atrophy. Very good. So go ahead and read it. Read what the exam is. Eight point uh, attention, uh, best corrected visual acuity with cycloplegic MRX for amblyopia, pupils for APD, uh, pressure check for glaucoma with upper eyelid plexiform neurofibroma, bag of worms on palpation, EOMs for strabismus. Uh, confrontation visual field and cafe au lait spots on the skin, axillary freckling, neurofibromas, proptosis, slump exam for corneal edema. Oh, hopstriae. Okay. Why? Uh, Why? Why? Why would I say corneal edema and hopstriae? 
I guess like in the setting of congenital glaucoma. For, exactly. Because a plexiform nerve fibroma can cause glaucoma. Keep going. Enlarged corneal nerves, lish nodules on the iris, uh, DFE for hematomas, cupping, pallor, edema, folds, collaterals. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. Everything makes sense. What kind of special tests would you do if this patient was in your clinic? Uh, brain imaging. Would you do that in clinic? In clinic first. Oh, oh, in clinic. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could, let's see. The patient has glaucoma. We could definitely do an RNFL. Uh, Good. Could... The patient has proptosis. Oh, like her tells? Very good, very good. The other thing you should do is you should check their blood pressure because patients with neurofibroma may have kidney issues and that could affect their blood pressure as well. So you wanna check their vitals, you wanna do glaucoma testing, you wanna take some photos, you wanna do Hertel, okay? Um, now you said imaging, right? So you do imaging, what are you looking for on imaging? I know you're looking for optic nerve gliomas, but how does that look like? What is the buzzword? I forgot. That's okay. The buzzword, go ahead and read it. A fusiform, that's right. Uh, optic nerve glioma has fusiform enlargement and kinking and sphenoid yes. wing dysplasia. That's yeah, right. so, for, so for the imaging, you want to look for two things. You want to look for the optic nerve glioma. It's going to be enlarged and it's going to be kinked. Right here, it's kinked. It looks kind of like an S, but it's also going to be enlarged, okay? And the other thing is, is um, neurofibroma is associated with bone issues. So these patients have scoliosis, kyphosis, but they also may have sphenoid wing dysplasia. And the last thing is you could also do some genetic testing for labs. And genetic testing, obviously, you're looking for NF1, correct? Yeah. Um, we'll get to that. So your assessment, what do you think this is? You think this is neurofibroma 1 with some list nodules? What's your plan? Uh, what do you do about list nodules? Can you do anything? No. No. What do you do about the uh, uh, what do you do about the optic nerve gliomas? Do you do anything? Well, depends. Uh, you know, if it's like it's severely visually limiting, then uh, I think in in some situations you do surgical uh, debulking. But in most cases, like chemo or radiation, I believe. Good. What, what, why do you wait for? Why can't you just you know debulk this right away if you see it and if it's not affecting his vision? If it's not affecting vision? Yeah. Why don't you still debulk it? Oh, I mean, there's a pretty high risk of, you know, Very damage. Good. Very good. Yeah, exactly. So go ahead and read that. Monitor optic nerve gliomas, but if visually threatening, then consider radiation or excision. Treatment can cause vision loss. Excellent. Uh, anything else that you would talk to these, like, family about? Would you, would you say anything else to the family? And then what? how long would you follow up with these patients? Well, I feel like you can just kind of monitor routinely, like every what, uh, in the in the first stage of diagnosis, like every couple months or so, and then slowly span out um, just to see if there's any changes in the uh, ophthalmic exam findings. But I think this warrants more of systemic referral for like you know other workups. Excellent. Go ahead and read it. Optic nerve gliomas are slowly growing, but there is a risk of nerve compression with proptosis and decreased vision. Uh, NF1 with uh, PCP uh, counseling and neurology uh, is needed due to risk of hypertension, scoliosis, developmental delay, and risk of neurofibromas becoming malignant. Follow-up uh, is for amblyopia strabismus glaucoma management, if vision stable every few months, and also give monocular precautions. Fantastic job, Ryan. I know it was super early in the morning. I kind of caught you off guard, but you did, good. you did very good. So this is how I remember NF1. Again, uh, for anybody who's watching, feel free to take it. Feel free to throw it in the trash. I don't care. This kind of helped me with my OCAPs. So for NF1, I thought of the show Glee because of gliomas. And there's a, you know, and I thought of the song Wrecking Ball, which on Glee they sang because it kind of goes with Von Recklinghausen, which is another word for NF1. Okay. Um, this is what this is what NF is. These are these neurofibromas. So initially, automatically, if you see these patients in clinic, uh, you could tell they have NF1 if they just if you look at their arm and you see this. Okay. Um, there's a picture of a galaxy. This girl's swinging on a wrecking ball in the galaxy because again, if they have a plexiform neurofibroma, there's an increased risk of glaucoma if it's on the upper eyelid. Okay. Um, 
other uh, physical exam findings, you may find sphenoid wing dysplasia. So on the show, there's a wing over here. She's drinking coffee, so cafe au lait spots and Irish lish nodules. The coffee is delicious, so it's lish nodules. And then this is the glee for the gliomas. Again, fusiform and enlarged with kinking on MRI. Uh, another kind of test question that they like is they'll say, you know, what are these optic nerve gliomas comprised of? And they're pillocytic astrocytomas. So I think of a pillow and an astronaut. And they're, they're also comprised of Rosenthal fibers, which are the generating cell processes found in the optic nerve glioma. So I have these roses all over, Rosenthal fibers. And the last thing is, it's again, Vin Diesel's autosomal dominant. He's also singing with her wrecking ball. And you treat it, treatment is observed unless there's progressive visual loss or growth more posteriorly into the CNS. And just know that if you treat it, you can actually cause more vision loss. Okay, very good. Let's do another one. Let's do NF2. Uh, should I call out or is someone brave enough to, uh, to do it? Uh-oh. All right. Well, Preston. Preston, it's going to be a hard one. You ready for this? Yes, not. Uh, let's do Cody. Cody, you ready for this? Yeah, I can try. Good, buddy. What do you see on this picture up here? Um, small here, but I'm guessing, um, I don't know, some sort of enhancement next to the nerve there in the canal. No, no, no. Just this top picture. Look at the top picture. Oh, this top picture here? Yeah. Um, that's even smaller. Um, I think it's smaller because uh, you're on your phone? Yeah. Is there, like, is there like shunt vessels? Yes, that's exactly it. What are some causes of some shunt vessels? What causes shunt vessels? Um, I think meningioma a lot. Um, maybe any sort of like compressive lesion or different sort of yes. vascular. Cause. Very good. Very good. So it's good to know a couple of things in the back of the nerve. So any kind of tumor, whether it's optic nerve glioma or optic nerve a uh, nerve sheath meningioma or a capillary hemangioma, anything behind the eye, anything that's causing pressure on the eye, papilledema, if it's chronic, can do it, uh, or anything in front of the eye that's causing a lot of pressure like glaucoma or CRVO, which can also be associated with glaucoma, okay? Uh, obviously, we, again, do the history. We ask about the onset and duration of any kind of visual symptoms. This is a pregnant woman, by the way, who's in your clinic. You ask about any kind of systemic neurological issues and if you're thinking optic nerve, sh nerve sheath meningioma, you should also ask about hearing issues. Okay, what are you looking for on exam if you're if you're kind of leaning towards optic nerve sheath meningioma? So I guess you'd want to look for APD. You'd probably want to do color vision. Um, you can look for proptosis or EOM problems, depending where it's at. Um, you could just check visual acuity, of course. Um, you could look for any maybe swelling of the nerve or the shunt vessels like we talked about. Um, Good. How about slit lamp exam? Anything uh, kind of interesting on slit lamp exam? Again, you did you knocked it out of the park. You said everything correct. I'm just asking for anything more. Anything else uh, specifically on, uh, could you see list nodules with NF2? Um, with NF2, I think you... Well, I know they're more associated with NF1, but I think you can still maybe see them. I'm not sure. Very good. Yeah, you still can see them. And then an NF2, are they associated with any kind of cataract? Um, I always get posterior subcapsular if I don't know the answer. But You're the man. Very good. Very, very good. Go ahead and read that if you can. Can you or uh, no? Yeah, I think so. Eight-point exam, uh, attention to BCVA, pupils for APD, extracular movements, computational visual field, rule out NF2, cafe LA spots, no fibromas, proptosis, um, SLE for Irish leash nodules, PSC, cortical wedge cataract, DFE, hamartoma, oh, morning glory disc anomaly, I haven't heard of that, power edema, collaterals, rule out cupping, and NV. NV is a good one. I wouldn't have thought about looking for NV. Yeah, you so. rule out NV because you're associated with CR. It could These optociliary shunt vessels could be associated with CRVO. So if you're still thinking, oh, is, I just see optociliary shunt vessel, could this be a CRVO? Well, look yeah. for any NV, look for any kind of, you know, tortuosity of blood vessels. If you think that it could be glaucoma, look for cupping. But this was, this was just to rule it out. You did excellent. 
uh, okay, what kind of special testing would you do in clinic? Oh, well, in clinic, um, I know it's the last one we talked about doing like at hotels. Um, I guess if you're worried about the optic nerve, you could get an RNFL. Um, awesome. Also, awesome. Awesome. Go ahead and read that off. Um, so again, vitals, cranial nerve exam, RNFL, Humphrey visual field color plate photos, hotel. Would you, okay, now you decide, okay, I can't just know what it is based on my, my special testing. I have to do images, okay? You decide to do this image over here. What are you looking for for optic nerve sheath meningioma? Um, I remember it's like a, it's usually like a pedunculated lesion coming off of the meninges, but, um, pedunculated lesion the off of the meninges. No, I wouldn't utilize that term. Pedunculated, that word goes with papilloma. You think gotcha. pedunculated, the keyword is papilloma. Anyway, okay. but let's skip that. Optic nerve sheath meningioma, when you're looking on imaging, you're looking for two things and they're dependent on whether you get a coronal cut or if you get an axial cut. So let's look at this first view. This first view is what kind of cut? That'd be coronal. Excellent. Oh, no, sorry, it, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If you do, if okay. you do a, a frontal cut or a coronal cut, the, the lesion of an optic nerve sheath meningioma, since it's literally a meningioma around the optic nerve sheath, it looks like a bullseye. It's a bullseye target, okay? If you're going to do an axial cut, then it's going to look like a, a tram track. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Tram track. That's bullseye. Tram track. Now you can actually also see this with perineuritis, but with perineuritis, you're going to see bullseye. Gonna, but perineuritis, you can have eye pain. It's inflammatory. With optic nerve sheath meningioma, you'll see bullseye, and it, it's not going to have any pain. Okay. Uh, and then also you can look at the vestibular region for looking at any mm -hmm. kind of schwannomas. Okay. Uh, What's your assessment? We think this is a ciliary shunt vessel because of an optic nerve sheath meningioma. What's your plan? So what plan, do you do for optic nerve sheath meningiomas in a pregnant woman with decreased vision? Um, I don't know if you do anything in a pregnant woman. I know you can sometimes treat them with like focused radiation. Um, yeah. But in a pregnant woman, I don't know if I would do anything. Go, go ahead and read it all if you can. Um, observe if vision worsening, consider radi radiation treatment, but risk of injury to nerve, optic nerve sheath meningioma is benign, typically found in middle-aged females, can progress in pregnancy, um, uh, visual acuity from 2020 to severe vision loss based on extent of mass, check family for NF2 autosomal dominant, and then follow up every few months. Okay. And then the extent Excellent of job. Yeah, okay. Excellent job. Uh, if anybody has any questions along the way, go ahead and stop me. Okay. So this is the way, this is kind of the way I remember NF2. With NF2, I'm a big movie guy. I think of uh, Black Swan. It's a movie with, uh, what's her name? Uh, Natalie Portman, because it helps me remember bilateral vestibular schwannomas. Okay. There's a very weird scene in the movie. I don't recommend the movie, whatever, uh, but it's a very, but it's a very interesting movie. Uh, there's a weird movie where she's in the train and that kind of helps me remember the tram track scene. Uh, Tram track sign is seen in optic nerve sheath meningioma, but it could also, you can also have optic nerve sheath meningioma affect the spinal nerves or within the brain itself. All meningiomas could be found anywhere with NF2. If you did a biopsy of the gliomas of NF1, it'll be uh, Rosenthal fibers. But if you did a biopsy of the optic nerve sheath meningioma, it'll be Antony A and B which kind of reminds me of like Antonio Banderas. Just think of when you're kind of on a subway in New York, there's a bunch of posters on the windows. So this is Antonio for Antonio A and B fibers. And then on top of it, there's another poster for Cats, Broadway show in New York. That helps you remember the subcapsular cataract as well as the cortical wedge cataract, which is seen in specifically in NF2. Other things that are found in NF2, this is Natalie Foreman on Good Morning America, helps you with morning glory disc anomaly as well as uh, fibrous dysplasia. This is her dissing on SNL. Uh, again, another poster of Vin Diesel. It's autosomal dominant. It's chromosome 2, NF2 gene. And you treat, again, with, with radiation. You can offer it, but again, there's a risk of uh, damaging the nerves. 
Cool, cool. Uh, who else? Who wants to do this, or sh go ahead? Should I call? I have it, or if you want, Cody, you can pick on some. I can go. Uh, ahead. I, I, I who says like, that? Who's, who is brave? It's Jahan. Jahan, I love it. Good for you, brother. Go ahead. All right. So, uh, top photo, you see a port wine stain on a kid's face. And then. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. All yeah. right. Um, you obviously are going to always do a history. And yes. when you do the history, uh, you ask for the onset, duration of symptoms. You ask for any vision changes. The baby rubbing his eyes is, you know, is the eyes wandering. But you're also going to ask about blepharospasm, epiphora, photophobia. What is that called? That is the uh, that is the triad for glaucoma, congenital glaucoma. Right. Anybody who has congenital glaucoma, uh, the triad physical findings is blepharospasm, epiphora, photophobia. If that if that baby has any kind of spasming of his eyes, if it's a lot of watery eyes and he's sensitive to the light, you have to think of any kind of glaucoma. As well as any review of systems, you want to ask for any kind of seizures, which we'll talk about later. All right, sounds good. Exam. What are you going to do on your exam? Uh, so this is a little kid. So you would do, uh, I mean, you would try your best to do a visual acuity with whatever you do for kids. I haven't done PED yet, so I forgot the name of it. Uh, uh, but you do a visual acuity, uh, get pressures, uh, probably with, you know, palpation. Uh, check for APD, uh, do just probably a gross, uh, try, maybe try and do a gr gross like uh, anterior segment exam and do it. What a are you DFA. looking for an anterior segment exam? If somebody Hob has congenital glaucoma. A Hobstrie. Excellent. Very good. Hobstrie, yeah. which is, you know what Hobstrie is, by the way? Isn't it like uh Breaks and decimate like horizontal Excellent. breaks. Excellent. And How about this? Ready? What is Vokes strie? I'm not here to confuse you, but just just so we can kind of clear up our brains of all these different types of strie. What is a Vokes strie? Isn't Vokes strie seen in keratoconus? Excellent. Very good. But what's the difference between Hobbs strie and Vokes strie? Um, Vokes strie is is within the stroma. Versus obstries within decimates. Cool. Excellent job. Uh, keep going. So now you see obstria, you see corneal nerves. With congenital glaucoma, is the cornea bigger or smaller or the same size as the other eye? Um, I guess bigger. Very big. Too big. Yeah. Strangely big. And then what are you looking at the nerves? Uh, for cupping. Excellent job. With Sturt, now, what are you thinking this is? What do you think this could be? You said Port Sturge. Weinstein. Yeah, so you're thinking Sturge Weber. First, good. Sturge Weber, what else could you see on the retina? Uh, Sturge Weber, can't you see the hemangio, hemangiomas? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, very, yeah. very good. All right, go ahead and read that for me, bud. All right, so an eight-point exam, attention to BCVA with cycloplegic MRX. Uh, IOP for glaucoma, uh, external exam for port wine stain, slit lamp exam, measure corneal diameter, edema, hopstrie, DFE for cupping, and for diffuse choroidal hemangioma. Ke oh, yeah, it's the ketchup red fundus and looking also for serous RDs. Choroidal hemangiomas could be associated with serous RDs. Now, I have this picture over here. It's not that, do you know what? This is the ketchup red fundus, by the way. Right. This is the left eye, the ketchup red versus the right eye. It's not as red. It's a little pinkish or orange. This is a B scan, okay? You don't really typically do B scans on this baby. You can, but the B scan here shows this lesion. Now, this is not the same as this. This picture up here is a diffuse Diffuse is the key word, choroidal hemangioma. The B scan, I just showed it as an example, is actually a local choroidal hemangioma. It's not diffuse, it's focal. But nonetheless, the internal reflectivity, is it high or low with choroidal hemangiomas? It looks high. Yes, exactly. So for choroidal melanoma, it's low, melanoma. Mm -hmm. For hemangioma, it's high mangioma. High internal reflectivity with hemant with high mangioma, melanoma is low internal reflectivity. That's just another buzzword they can attest to. Okay. But you wouldn't really typically do this test because 
it's not like you're looking for a typical mass. The entire choroid is going to be high internal reflectivity uh, versus if it was a focal hemangioma, which could be seen sometimes in adults, you'll see the whole rest of the choroid having normal. But then once you go in this region, it will be high. Not here to confuse you, but anyway. Uh, special testing for this baby, what would you do? Uh, you would get probably MRIs of the brain to see uh, if that if, oh. that's fine that's totally cool you would do an mri oh. before you do oh. mri what kind of like ophthalmological testing could you do um let's see i don't know exam under anesthesia excellent FA. excellent 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 if you're going to do an exam under anesthesia think of everything you could bring with you to the or should you bring a gonio with you absolutely absolutely uh, should you bring a pachymetry with you Absolutely. Could you bring calipers to measure the cornea diameter? Yes. Pressure. Kind of, yeah. Exactly. So, so a lot of stuff that you could bring with you in the, in the exam room. The, the one thing that you could kind of remember is they also like to test you on is on gonio. Uh, you're going to have abnormal findings. If the baby is less than 10 years old, the, the trabecular meshwork, the, pa the reason why this baby has glaucoma is because his angle is, is, is not formed well. But if the baby is greater than 10 years old, when you do a gonio, it's not because the angle isn't formed well. It's simply because this baby has such high uh, cerebral uh, pressure that you're going to see blood in Schlem's canal. And that's what causes the glaucoma. Anyway, that's just something they'll test you. Uh, like you said, you do an MRI. And the reason why you do an MRI it's not because you're looking for a meningioma. It's not because you're looking for glioma. It's because you're looking for leptomeningeal vascular malformations. Cool? Cool. Assessment, just like you said, Port Weinstein from Steers Weber with glaucoma. Uh, what's your plan? How do you treat the glaucoma? Uh, you need surgical, about, uh, surgical intervention. What kind of surgery? Uh, either you can do a TRAB or uh, I think it's a goniotomy. Very good. It's actually not a trab. It's a trabeculotomy, which is different okay. than a trabeculectomy. Okay? okay. A trab is a trabeculectomy. Mm -hmm. Okay. A trabeculotomy is, it's a very cool surgery. It's legitimately just removing the trabecular meshwork. It's a really very cool surgery. Hopefully one of the pediatric glaucoma specialists could show it to you. I don't know if there is one, but a very cool surgery, but it's different than a trab. Uh, the reason the, when do you do a goniotomy versus a trabeculotomy? Well, for gonio, you need a clear view to see it. So you could do a goniotomy, which is literally removing the trabecular meshwork under gonio, versus a trabecu, trabeculotomy. You don't need a gonio, you just remove the trabecular meshwork externally. How about before you do surgery? Let's just say you have to do surgery next week. How do you control the pressure? IOP lowering drops. Which drop do you avoid? Bramonidine. Excellent job. How about for PDT? What do you do? I'm so sorry. I gave it away. How about for choroidal hemangiomas? What kind of treatment can you do? Yeah, as you said, PDT. You're the man. Uh, go ahead and read all of that, bud. Okay. So the plan, if pressure is high, start IOP lowering. Uh, GTTs avoid bramonidine in infants, plus or minus diamox until goniotomy, trabeculotomy. For choroidal hemangioma, consider PDT. For amblyopia, full correction with patching, uh, uh, commonage with neurology and PCP due to risk of seizures. Full um, manage, I apologize, it's super dash. Go ahead, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I was like, wait a second. Uh, <laughs> education, <laughs> both glaucoma and choroidal hemangioma from uh, Sturge Weber can cause permanent vision loss. Sturge Weber is sporadic, not inherited. You want to tell it to the family because if they're saying, can I get another baby? And will he have Serge Weber? No, it's not like NF1. It's not like NF2. These, this is actually just sporadic. So if the, if the parents have another child, it should not be affected. Keep going. Follow up amblyopia and glaucoma management until adulthood may need multiple glaucoma surgeries. Return precautions for seizure and stroke episodes. Avoid contact sports. Excellent. So this is the way that I remember Serge Weber. This is probably my favorite one. Uh, this is when I was really starting off. Uh, doing these slides. When I think of Serge Weber, I think of Spider-Man because um, it has web in it. Uh, it's also called encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis. So just like NF1 is called von Recklinghausen, 
uh, NF2 is, you know, schwannoma. Sturge Weber is encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis. Encephalo just means brain, uh, trigeminal because of that port wine stain and angio blood. Uh, again, there's uh, Spider-Man's kind of hanging out in the galaxy and, and he was bitten. So it's sporadic. It's not inherited. FYI, so is Wybert Mason, which we'll talk about later. Uh, you know, spider mans just chilling out. He's hanging out underneath the stars because the galaxy before 10, primary angle abnormality in the side of the port wine stain. After 10, increased episcleral venous pressure. He's drinking some wine because of the port wine stain. And he's also having some French fries with ketchup because of the tomato ketchup fundus, which is the ipsilateral diffuse coroidal hemangioma. And then lastly, a uh, little spider web that looks kind of red is leptomeningeal vascular malformations, which can cause calcifications and thus, and thus can cause seizures. Excellent job. This is a very hard one. Is anybody, Jahan, either you pick one or someone volunteers. I could try, Mo. Betty? Yeah. All right, let's do it, Betty. Betty, what is your fundus photo? Oh, I'm sorry, I said 12 year old with this MRI. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but what about 12, 12 year old with this fundus photo? What do you see in the fundus photo? Um, looks like there's something going on with the nerve. It has like really regular borders. Um, Excellent. Yeah, an elevated retinal temporal optic disc mask. I love it. Uh, obviously, again, for the history, you're going to ask what the onset duration of any kind of symptoms is the eyes crossing, is the eyes, you know, is he not seeing well? Is there any kind of neurological systemic issues? Uh, on your brain, you're thinking about maybe this could be retinoblastoma, maybe this could be a tumor, maybe this could be astrocytic hematoma. So what's your exam? What are you looking for on exam? And there's pictures to help you. Um, you can look for like ash leaf spots, I think. Excellent. And then like uh, sebaceous adenomas. Uh, I'm not sure what that nail finding is, but yeah. What, what happened? Are you not sure about what? The nail finding there. It's called a periungual fibroma. There's mm -hmm. actually a lot of ophthalmologists, a lot of case reports that have found uh, that have reported that a patient will walk in with this retinal finding. The first thing the ophthalmologist does is look at the patient's thumbs or fingers. And if they find this, which is periungual, ungual just means, uh, you know, finger or thumb, uh, uh, this fibroma then the person's automatically characterized with uh, tuberous sclerosis. Um, very good. Go ahead and read the exam, please. Um, so eight-point exam, attention to best corrective visual acuity with uh, cyclopegic refraction, amblyopia, IOP pupils for APDEOMs for strabismus, count, uh, confrontation visual fields, external for cafe au lait spots, facial. Patients could still have cafe au lait spots, by the way. So this is still NF1, obviously, <laughs> NF2, obviously, but even with tuberous sclerosis, they could still have cafe au lait spots. Keep going. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Facial angiofibromas, aka adenomas, periungal fibromas, ash sleep spots, chagrin patches, um, slit lymph exam, iris leash nodules, DFE for astrocytic hamartomas, retinal nerve fiber layer, pallor edema folds, roll out retinoblastoma, hypopion, vitritis, subretinal fluid. Cool. Now the astrocytic hamartoma is found in the retinal nerve fiber layer. So what's the best test that you could do in clinic to help show you that this is an astrocytic hamartoma? Because you know that only astrocytic hamartomas can exist in the retinal nerve fiber layer. What's a great test to do in clinic? You could do RNFL. Yeah, you do an RNFL. Oh, Absolutely. Okay, very good. So you do an RNFL, you could do, again, home visual fields, you could do OCT because it's found in the RNFL. Um, uh, okay, uh, imaging, what are you looking for on imaging? Um, you can see like the, I guess on the MRI, it shows the tuber, tuberous lesions, like tubers. And that's why it's called tuberous sclerosis, okay? Uh, you'll find cortical tubers. Those can calcify. Patients can also then have uh, uh, seizures. And uh, I didn't include it here, but with, with tuberous sclerosis, uh, Vokes triad, this guy Vokes came up with a lot of stuff. Uh, one of the, and, and, he, and the triad also exists for something else that's general surgery, surgery related, but it's also, there's another Vokes triad specifically for tuberous sclerosis. And the Vokes triad is, this is again back, you know, 
in the 1900s, we didn't, they didn't have a lot of imaging. They just said, if a patient comes in with mental retardation, seizures, and skin findings, that is Vokes triad. This person has tuberous sclerosis. Um, this is actually very hard and it's very new. One of the treatments that you could do for astrocytic hematoma that Dr. Harbour does a lot and he published a lot of papers on is he treats it with mTOR inhibitors, uh, pills like Everolimus and Cyrolimus and Tacrolimus, and it actually helps shrink this. Not expecting you guys to know that, but if you did know that, it's actually a very uh, cool thing to know. Uh, go ahead and read um, the rest. Um, so astrocytic hematomas typically remain stable throughout the life. Progressive growth is uncommon. Um, Co-managed with neuro, PCP due to risk of seizures, mental developmental delay, heart rhabdomyomas, kidney angiomyolipoma, family planning with geneticists, autosomal dominant, um, amblyopia and strabismus management for follow-up, a visual acuity stable every one month and extend monocular precautions. Very cool. Very cool. Makes sense for everybody. If anybody has any questions, you let me know. This is how I remember tuberous sclerosis. I remember tube because the television is also called the tube. So kind of like you're watching the tube. And as you're watching the tube, you're watching, you know, <laughs> DJ Tiesto. So it kind of helped me remember with tuberous sclerosis. And Tiesto is kind of playing in this forest themed, you know, whatever, uh, uh, rave. Uh, and uh, we'll get to why he's in a forest. Uh, and as you're watching the tube, you've got a movie that's called Weekend at Bernie's, and you've got Pringles that you're just munching on because another name for tuberous sclerosis is Bernieville Pringle disease. Has anybody ever watched Weekend at Bernie's? It's one of my favorite movies. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is a picture of the astrocytic hematoma. I've got an astronaut. Uh, the astronaut you also saw where? An NF1, because it's pilocytic astrocytomas. This is a glial astrocytoma. It's found in the nerve fiber layer. Again, found in 50% of patients. Uh, it's bilateral in 30%. Other findings that you'll see is you'll see uh, chagrin patches, which are these, which are what, what I'm, why it's kind of in the forest. Um, you'll find ash leaf spots. You'll find periungual fibromas. So you're kind of clicking on the remote for the television. Uh, and then these are the chagrin patches and the facial angiofibromas, like we talked about. You'll have these cortical tubers, and you'll have Vokes triad, again, because it's in the forest, for seizures, mental retardation, skin findings. And that helps you find, that helps you kind of connect the ash leaf and the green um, chagrin patches. Uh, it is also autosomal dominant, so there's another movie kind of next to you in the television. Uh, that movie is a Vin Diesel movie. It's autosomal dominant, and it's a, the chromosome 9, chromosome 16 that could be affected, which are the hamartin and tuberin gene, which kind of helps you remember the tuberous sclerosis. Okay, almost done, guys. There's only like three or four more phacomatoses, and I don't really have much of my mnemonics really for this because nothing else can look like this. You know, astrocytic hematomas have a lot of associations, but uh, okay, either Betty, you pick someone, or if someone wants to volunteer, you're more than welcome. Go ahead, Betty, pick someone. I can go if you want. Mary Mac, good. What do you see in this fundus photo? Um, well, I'm guessing it's telling me that it is a retinal capillary hemangioblastoma. Good. Describe it for me, though. What do you see? Um, there are like very tortuous um, and dilated uh, veins and I guess arteries too. Just stop. In my very head. good. Very yeah. good. Yeah. And it kind of looks like a, it kind of looks like a little bomb. It's kind of tick off and explode. That's why I, I like the word blast because it actually looks like it's going to blast. Okay. Uh, just like any kind of history, you're going to ask about the onset and duration of symptoms. You're going to ask about any kind of vision changes. And uh, specifically, you're going to kind of talk about any kind of kidney or neuro issues, which we'll talk about later. Okay, exam findings. Uh, go ahead and, and walk me through your eight-point exam. Um, so you're going to just check, um, especially for acuity, there are 11, so you can look for like amblyopia, any kind of strabismus or papilledema. Um, the anterior, I don't know if there are any like anterior findings. Nope, there isn't. You're doing great. 
Um, and then you'll do a good dilated exam because you can have these like hemangioblastomas and they can be big or small. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, go ahead and read that off. Okay, exam. We're looking for best corrected visual acuity with cycloplegic um, refraction. Pupils, looking for an APD, IOP, EOMs, confrontational visual fields. We'll look for proptosis, do our slit lamp exam, and a scler scleral depressed dilated exam. Looking for these vascular lesions with dilated feeder and draining vessels. May be associated with CME, exudate, serous RDs, optic nerve for juxtapapillary hemangiomas with edema or parapapillary CMV. And we'll look at both eyes because bilateral disease in 50% and then ask about family history. Yes, and if you actually have a, that 11 year old and the father is there right next to them or the mother is there right next to them, you might as well just say, hey, would you like me to dilate your eyes and take a look at this? Because most likely it's autosomal dominant and one of the parents will have it. Uh, it's also good to do a scleral depressed exam because sometimes it's far in the periphery and you may not even see a small one that could be hiding. Um, excellent. What kind of special testing could you do in clinic? Um, well, you would want a fundus photo of this and I guess you could get an OCT if you wanted, but I feel like an FA would be the most revealing. You're the best. You're the best. You do an OCT because these could be associated with CME and ERM and on FA, uh, this is a buzz. This is a good word right here because uh, it's very different than other FA findings for other uh, phacomatoses. This will have leakage. So with with hemangioblastomas, can you guys see my screen that I'm typing or not really? Yeah, we can. Good hemangioblastomas, FA. It's gonna look like this, okay? So that's that's leakage. So it's gonna look like, this is, a, this is a hemangioblastoma and then afterwards it starts to leak, it starts to leak like crazy, okay? Very different than the other fake, uh, than, than maybe two more that we'll talk about later, okay? Uh, what, kind of what kind of imaging would you do? Um, I think you want brain imaging. Why? Uh, because you can have these like hemangioblastomas in the brain. Where specifically in the brain could they usually be found? They could be found anywhere, but most of the time they're found in this part of the brain. No clue. Cerebellum. Okay, cerebellum. Yeah. Oh yeah, and Cerebell then we want, we want to do imaging um, of the kidney. So I guess CT is the best. Good. Way and why for the kidney? Um, because they're more likely to get renal cell carcinoma. Good, and that's what they usually die from. By the way, these patients with von Hippel-Landau disease, they usually have eye issues fine. They've got brain issues, fine, but they usually die young, 30s, 40s, because they have kidney cancer. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thing for you to know, because that's going to be on your like uh, note. Must follow up with, with, with the you know, nephrology, blah, 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 covers your, your butt, because if you don't and they die, whatever. Okay, uh, assessment, retinal capillary hemangioblast uh, hemangioblastoma or hemangioma from von Hippel-Landau disease. Uh, you know, by the way, guys, uh, just, just to kind of put things more into perspective, um, um, you know, when you see that red lesion on the eyelid, what is that called, Mary Mac? Like a baby's got a big red lesion on her on the eyelid and it's at a young age. What's that called? A uh, hemangioma. Yeah, it's the same thing, actually. So it's a capillary hemangioma of the eyelid. The capillary hemangioma, if it's in the retina, it's von Hippel-Landau disease. Does that make sense? Yes. How do you treat the capillary hemangioma on the eyelid? Um, with oral beta blockers. Good. You can actually, there have been reports that you could treat this with oral beta blockers as well. I should have included that, but I didn't. Uh, what kind of treatments do, pay, do, do we usually do? You can go ahead and just read the rest. Okay. Um, so the plan is to observe if, if the lesion is small, less than 500 microns, peripheral or no exudation. And then you can do laser, cryo, or transpupillary thermotherapy 
or PDT if it's visually significant. So then although benign, these can be associated with vision loss from exudation, CME and ERM, co-managed with PCP for evaluation of cerebellum and spinal cord, renal cell carcinoma, pancreatic cysts, pheochromocytoma, and then a genetics consult because it's autosomal dominant on chromosome three. And then you can follow up every few weeks to months, depending on location of the lesion, presence of macular edema, et cetera. Excellent. Good. I don't really have a way of remembering this because to be quite honest, nothing else looks like it. If it looks like kind of like a ticking time bomb, it's a hemangioblastoma. And then with hemangioblastoma, just remember kidney is going to kill you and cerebellar. Um, and then for treatment, if it's small, you can just watch it. And if it's big, you've got a bunch of ways. But again, these guys just really need good uh, systemic follow-up. Okay. Mary Matt, you can go ahead and take some more. You've got two more left, guys. So uh, just I can know, take work. one. Good job, Danny. Uh, what do you see on this top right fundus photo? Go ahead, Danny. You're on mute. Sorry, I muted myself again. Um, a cluster of very dilated vessels um, all throughout the the fundus. Absolutely. Yeah, this is an AV malformation, but so is hemangioblastoma. That's an AV malformation as well. And it's got these very, nothing else will look like this. When I think of, when I see this picture, I automatically think of Medusa's hair. Medusa's got all this like dragons and whatever serpents off her hair. That's kind of what it looks like. I, I mean, you know, um, Wyburn Mason it has a variety of ways. So I don't want them to trick you. Usually they're going to, usually they're going to give you, you know, very similar pictures. Right? It kind of looks like that, but sometimes it can look like this. Okay, so I'm not, I don't, I don't want this picture to show up and you'd be like, well, I'm used to Mo's picture. It looks so much like Medusa's hair. It can, it can, you know, it can be in a spectrum. It could be very, very small or it could be the whole thing. Cool. Okay. Obviously do the same kind of history, uh, but specifically you're going to ask about this bleeding of the dental facial surgery, which we'll talk about later. So go ahead. What kind of exam would you do? Um, you want to test vision, pressure, pupils, um, and then do your normal anterior segment exam and then check both, um, both of the fundus, uh, fundus in both eyes. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it. You did great. So uh, go ahead and read that. Okay. So um, an eight-point uh, exam with attention to uh, best corrected visual acuity with cycloplegic refraction, checking for amblyopia. Um, check pupils for an APD, IOP, um, evaluate for glaucoma, EOM, looking for any strabismus, uh, confrontational visual fields, look for any proptosis, um, and then do a slit lamp exam, and then a DFE for um, AV malformations, vitreous hemorrhage, or optic nerve cupping. Yeah, sometimes Wyburn Mason can be associated with glaucoma, so you want to look for cupping and pressure. Okay, um, any kind of special testing you do in clinic? Um, you probably want to take some fundus photos, um, of both eyes. Um, I mean, you could take it, do an OCT Mac too. If it's in, as involved as this photo is, I'm not sure the, the quality of your images would probably not be great. But, um, if you were concerned for glaucoma, like if there was any elevated pressures in RNFL, but again, I'm not sure how that would look given the appearance of the fundus. Good. Good. Any other testing that you would do that Mary Mack mentioned for the hemangioblastoma? Oh, an FA. Yes, good. When you do an FA, the FA on this one doesn't leak. Okay, so the hemangioblastoma does leak. For this one, it's rapid filling because it's legitimately a shunt vessel between all of these arteries and veins. So once it hits the artery, it hits the veins because it's, it's connected, but it does not leak like the blastoma. Cool. And then would you do any kind of imaging? Would you order any imaging? Yeah, you'd want to do some, like, it's like not in the clinic. You're talking about like MRI, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, just looking for any other um, AB malformations, like in the CNS. Um. Uh, good. So this is now Wyburn Mason, aka Racimos hemangioma. That's another name for it. What's your plan? Um, well, I guess you. I'm not sure if there's any 
acute intervention um, for this. You just monitor them um, and then treat any associated conditions like glaucoma. Very good. Go ahead and read all of that stuff. Okay. Plan um, treatment of associated glaucoma or other ocular disease. Education. Um, discuss the risk of vision loss from intraocular hemorrhage, vascular obstruction, glaucoma. You'd co-manage with a PCP due to the risk of bleeding with dental and facial surgeries um, from maxillary or mandibular AVMs. Um, and then it's not non-hereditary um, in nature. Uh, and then for follow-up, um, if there's any amblyopia, subdrabismus, or glaucoma, you'd manage that. And then if the VA is stable, you can monitor every few months and give monocular yeah. precautions. Very good. So a couple of things I underlined, again, one of the things they may test you on is that these patients will come in with this finding and they'll say they went to the dentist and he just kept on bleeding. Because again, they may have AV malformations around the mandibular and maxillary arteries. And then again, very similar to Sturge Weber, it's non-hereditary. And then you know, just treat them like you would treat them for amblyopia or glaucoma. All right, Danny, go ahead and pick on someone. Or if someone wants to volunteer as to what this is. We got one more left, and that's it. Yes. What do you um, think? Is Anybody Preston there? there? Preston, go ahead, Preston. Are you there? I'm driving. Um, All right. Here. Uh, somebody who's not driving. Anybody else not driving? Let's do. Uh, let's do. Uh, I thought Ace was here. That's okay. Danny, go ahead. Danny, do you know what this could be? Uh, let's see. So what are what are what is this? <laughs> I gave it away. What is this on his eyes? What are they trying to show on the lips? What are they showing here on the ears? Do you know yeah, what those just, are? Um, a little vascular yeah, malformations. Yeah, these are, yeah. are telangiectatic vessels. Telangiectatic vessels. They're not really in, uh, injected. It's not really inflamed, but there's these weird uh, long uh, vessels that are found in the eyes, found in the mouth, found in the ears. Okay, so telangiectatic vessels. The thing that they're going to give away is they're going to say the patient also has ataxia. So this is ataxia telangiectasia. Just go ahead and just read this paragraph. Okay. Um, autosomal recessive condition. By age two, these patients develop truncal ataxia followed by dysarthria, uh, dystonia, and um, chorioathetosis. They are severely physically disabled by age 10. One of the earliest signs in the entire body is the impaired ability to initiate saccades. So uh, saccades. Does anybody know what saccades means? It's like smooth tracking. Or, yeah, you're, or, so good. you're so good. I love it. So so just like these patients have truncal ataxia, they legitimately can't even control their, their truncal mobility and their wobbling, their, their eyes are also wobbling, okay? It's not smooth. So even though they'll develop physical truncal ataxia and it'll be severely disabled by age 10, the earliest sign can be caught by an ophthalmologist because their eyes will also be ataxic. And then if they find the, te the telangiectasia, you found the, you found the diagnosis. So the ophthalmologist could be the first one to, to actually pick up on ataxia telangiectasia. Keep going. Um, telangiectasia is developed between ages three to five. Uh, these patients are also more sensitive to sunlight, um, have hypoplasia of the thymus and decreased levels of IgG. This leads to high prevalence of bacterial associated respiratory death in childhood. The gene defective is called ATM ataxia tel telangiectasia mutated gene. The normal gene is involved in repair of DNA and tumor suppression. The BRCA1 gene uh, is influenced by the gene product. Heterozygous female carriers have a seven times increased risk of bre uh, breast cancer and may account for 10% of all breast cancers in the U.S. Um, ATs also um, have increased risk of T-cell leukemias. So a lot of like factors, sorry, I spelled breast cancer wrong. A lot of things that's going on, uh, ATM gene, telangiectasia, ataxia, thymus. Because of the thymus, you have low IgG because low IgG, IgG is made in the thymus. 
because you have low IgG, you're more associated with infections. Because you have high infections, you can die uh, very young. On top of it, uh, the ATM gene, uh, it could also be somehow connected with the BRCA gene. That BRCA gene was a big, big gene that we learned in medical school with breast cancer. I think Angeline Jolie has a BRCA gene mu mutation, so she's associated with breast cancer. And on top of it, because of the thymus, they also have a high risk of T-cell leukemia as well. So a lot of things going on. This is kind of how I remember uh, ataxia telangiectasia. It's also known as Louis Barr syndrome. So I think of Louis C.K. Louis C.K., he could be sensitive to sunlight and he's in a bar. The bar, I, I used to put someone else, but the bar is like also BRCA bar. Uh, this was not the best slide, I apologize. I think my brain was getting tired of these slides. Uh, I have Mr. T, he's also in the bar because Mr. T with T cell leukemia, also the thymus, low IgG. Inside the bar, there's an ATM. An ATM, you can withdraw money for it and that'll that'll help you remember it's saccades for sack of money, so impaired ability for saccades. And Louis C.K. has eaten the Reese's Pieces. It's autosomal recessive. This is probably the only one that's not dominant or uh, non-hereditary. Uh, so this is the only one that's autosomal recessive you kind of think of him kind of drunk and dancing around in the bar for the ataxia, Louis Barr syndrome. And then the last, last, last one uh, that's a phacomatosis is retinal cavernous hemangioma. This is not a retinal capillary hemangioma. Capillary hemangioma is again between, you know, the blood vessels, the arteries and the veins, the capillary system, that is VHL. This is of the veins. This is retinal cavernous hemangioma. And for this one, there's only a couple of ways they could test you on it. Number one, it looks like a bunch of grapes. And this is what it looks like. It looks like a bunch of grapes. Uh, it's also autosomal dominant. And then number two, if you do an FA, unlike VHL, it does not leak. Um, and then secondly, it'll have saccular lesions. So it kind of has, it kind of, uh, it looks like it's, it looks like a, like a bunch of like sacks, like it's, 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 it's a grape. And then within each grape, the bottom half fills with blood. So it's a saccular lesion and it also does not work. That's about it, guys. You did very good. I'm sorry for uh, kind of drilling through uh, early this morning. But if you remember these eight phacomatoses and some of these buzzwords, you'll get all of the questions correct.